My name is Marcin Fabianski. I spent years wandering place to place. Phenomena are preceded by the mind, ruled by the mind, made of the mind. If you speak or act with a corrupted mind, then suffering follows you as the wheel of the cart, the track of the ox that pulls it. If you speak or act with a calm, bright mind, then happiness follows you like a shadow that never leaves. I have read these words of Buddha hundreds of times, but I have not listened to them. I did not listen to Socrates, who wondered that people wanted to find happiness in journeys, although they take themselves with them. I studied philosophy in Poland and in England, spent two years in Asian monasteries. In the end, I reached out to the roots of philosophy, understood as the medicine of the soul and the therapy of superstitions. I decided to set up a school of philosophy, similar to ancient schools to create a place where everyone can learn philosophical life and free oneself from suffering. Just here, near the town of Trevina Lazio. To achieve lasting joy of life, one must learn to limit ego's desires, develop morality, enter into meditation states which require many hours of subtle work with the mind, make an effort to understand the laws of nature. Parco Naturale dei Monti Simbruini is an ideal place for a school of philosophy where one can study all those things. Here one finds a contemplative nature, the caves where the saints meditated for 2000 years, the proximity of Rome, the spiritual and intellectual capital of the ancient world. Here I found not only a wonderful nature but also open people who sympathized with my idea. At the Appenine School of Living Philosophy, we do philosophy as it was done before it got corrupted by theoreticians. We do this through meditation, contemplation, studying the works of ancient masters, expeditions into nature, therapeutic conversations and inquiry. The starting point is the philosophical method self-of, based on the analysis of experience according to the model of the three dramaturgies of the self. Our brain does not react to regular stimuli. It needs something more complex, a story. A healthy story can liberate the mind from mental irritations. This is why it's worth to know the rules of narrative dramaturgy, which takes place in our imagination. Words, stories, scenarios for the future. It is also worthwhile learning morphic dramaturgy, which deals with the world of objects around us. But what helps most is exploring meditative submorphic dramaturgy of the subtle sensation within the process of life, before the brain has frozen it into a collection of objects. Each of these dramaturgies of self requires specific means of philosophical action. More about it in films that follow. We undertake philosophical practice, not just for ourselves, but also for next generation and the whole planet which is devastated by human greed and stupidity. The reward is ataraxia, a psychophysical state of attuning to nature beyond all irritation and non-excessive harmonious life. We are overloaded with information, but this does not make us wiser. Research shows that from the ocean of information we pick up those that support our opinions, not those that expand our horizon. How to create an intelligent content filtering system? How to learn to perpetuate what is valuable and let go of thought and imaginary trash? How to let oneself to get seduced by a healthy narrative dramaturgy? Philosophical schools of antiquity have designed many effective practices. Stoics, for example, worked towards mastering inner dialogue. The rush of thoughts, the clutter of frozen fragments of the past, the black scenarios for the future, that we suck in uncritically from the world. They employed thought experiments, enhancing inner images, repetition of stoic formulas. 
they kept diaries with personal notes which worked on them therapeutically. This is how one of the most thrilling works of antique philosophy, the Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, was created. They observed nature with the curiosity of a modern scientist, but they did not set themselves apart from it. Yes, the brain plays simulation films in its frontal lobe areas, which we take for reality. But we can write scripts for the films. Well, at least we can write some scenes. Here is a scene written by Marcus Aurelius, so employ your imagination. If you want to talk about people, you need to look down on the earth from above. Herds, armies, farms, weddings, divorces, births, deaths, noisy courtrooms, desert places, all the foreign peoples, holidays, days of mourning, market days, all mixed together, a harmony of opposites. Such mini contemplation could immediately bring us relief, relax our mental and physical tension and facilitate access to ataraxia. When we move our point of view high above human affairs, it turns out that what for us, the little ants, was a mother of life and death, may in fact be a trivia. Notes on a good life were written by Marcus Aurelius and Leonardo da Vinci, also by Montaigne, Pascal and many other philosophers who cared about the quality of their mental landscape even when there was no overload of information, as we experience today. This notes may include repeating autotherapeutic truths, description of experiments with life, conclusions from philosophical interventions, in short, everything that works. At the Appenin School of Living Philosophy, we discover the rules of such writing. Effective training in narrative dramaturgy leaves us with developed healthy habits. I'm walking down the street and whenever a story is going to steal my mindfulness, draw me into its emotional landscape and then spit out to the world of things with a psychophysical state I cannot foresee, I remember a quick rehearsed formula. Here is one of Marcus Aurelius' formulas. Discard your misperceptions. Stop being like a puppet to your impulses. Limit yourself to the present. The Greek word morphe means form or shape. The practice of philosophy through morphic dramaturgy is what Epictetus called dialogue with events. Morphic dramaturgy deals with reality perceived as a collection of objects and relationships between them. The greatest obstacle in the philosophical relationship with the world of objects is lust. We want to conquer the world, instead of watching it impartially, and even if we do not, we still have some requirements for it. We do not listen to Marcus Aurelius when he says and why should we feel anger at the world, as if the world would notice? We do not keep his advice. To accept it without arrogance, to let it go with indifference. The Greek philosophers have noticed that we do not know what brings us happiness. Epicurus said that fulfilling the three conditions is enough. Not to be hungry, not to be thirsty, to find protection from the weather. Everything beyond that, for example, exquisite food, is no longer an increase in happiness, but its diversification. And while chasing luxury, we create a deficit. We live in constant torment of failure, as no excess has its end. Researchers at the Stanford University have been tracking lives of some 1500 people from childhood to death for a hundred years to see what affects longevity and life satisfaction. It is neither good humor nor recognition 
nor concern for safety and avoidance of stress. The real factors are perseverance, diligence, hard work and commitment to the community. At prior, and you might think that the research was commissioned by the Benedictine order, which motto is Ora et Labora, pray and work. We know, however, that these results were obtained by impartial scholars. Before St. Benedict worked out his formula, he spent three years in a cave near Subiaco, practicing perseverance and understanding. The traits of character that bring people great benefits were called in antiquity virtues. And training in virtues was the basis for a happy life. Leonardo da Vinci, one of the greatest experts in the dramaturgy of the morphic world, had been watching water for decades. He wrote, water is the driving force in nature. It suffers change into as many natures as are the different places through which it passes. Thanks to persistent and engaged observations, he made more discoveries than any other human being in history. But mindfulness of the world of objects is not enough. Deep philosophical training is not only about being aware of reality, but about understanding its logic and experiencing its beauty. This is achieved by special training of attention, switching it from the habitual perception of the world as a collection of objects to perceiving reality as a process. We investigate intensity, variability and rhythm of the process of life in each of the dramaturgies of self. In the narrative self, attention stays on conceptual reality. In the morphic self, we perceive the process of life as a collection of objects. In the submorphic self, we perceive it as a flux of sensations. This is a dynamic system. Each dramaturgy may have tendency to change into another. In the narrative dramaturgy, awareness is immersed in a spaceless experience of storylines. In the morphic dramaturgy, awareness consists of the series of cognitive acts that separate objects in the space of the stream of attention. In the submorphic dramaturgy, non-conceptual experience becomes process and not object-centered. One way to enter submorphic worlds is to attune attention to the four elements – earth, water, air and fire. While working with earth element, for example, we give attention to its two characteristics – hardness and softness. Try hardness. Clinch your teeth and now release them. The sensation you experience right now in your mouth is definition of hardness. Now that you feel the definition of hardness, you can scan your body and see where hardness can be found. Attuning to the process of life is questioning self as our identity. By studying and exercising our codependence to the rest of the process of life. In submorphic dramaturgy, learned ethics is replaced by spontaneous compassion, by giving up the world as a collection of separate objects and thus breaking egocentric barriers. A deep tranquility emerges in our field of experience, facilitating access to ataraxia. But this is not the end. The practice of conscious attuning to the three dramaturgies of self will result in emergence of the fourth state of experience, which is neither somewhere in space nor spaceless, a state which I call the unaffected. But this is a completely different story. <laughs>